Lesson 21.1 is mainly just looking at the proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometry in a lot more detail. So please go back to the standard level uh, demo that I made of the different ways that the, the protons will spin and how that creates a magnetic field. Before I get into the spin coupling, just let's go into detail on TMS, tetramethylsilane standard and you need to know why we use it. Uh, we use it because it doesn't interfere with the compounds we're trying to deal with. It does that because silicon uh, dif behaves differently than the carbon, so it has a lower electronegativity, uh, so the line will not overlap with carbon. It's also got the advantage in that it's chemically inert, uh, it's soluble in organic solvents and, and you can boil it off easily, and all the hydrates are in the same environment. So it makes uh, a very simple, easy one to recognize. It won't interfere and it can be separated. Uh, just a few other notes too to help you with the problem solving. Uh, protons on the same atom do not split. They all, they all spin in the same direction. Uh, protons on non-adjacent non atoms do not interact with each other. They're too far away. And the proton on the hydroxyl group generally doesn't, doesn't split. So here we have an example of a proton that's spinning in one direction. It's spinning in this direction here. And so what you have is if this here, this proton's here spinning in the same direction, it's going to increase the magnetic effect that it has. If it's spinning in the opposite direction, it's not going to cause as much as, as great an effect because it's going to shield, shield out the, the magnetic effect. And please go to the standard level uh, to have a look at that. So we're going to have a look here at an example with ethanol, and we're going to look at the effect of this either spinning up or spinning down, assuming that all these hydrogens in this environment are spinning up. So uh, when it's spinning up, and this one is also spinning up, that's called shielding. Uh, and shielding is going to allow a greater energy release uh, and that's called a, a movement downfield. Uh, and so what we have here, what we have here is a greater amount of energy, uh, magnetic field energy being created. Now with this particular one here downward, that one's called deshielding. And so it's going to decrease the amount of energy that that proton's going to have, the magnetic force. And so in high resolution, we're going to be able to see that these, we're not just going to see one peak, we're going to see two. All right, so uh, because there is uh, one neighboring hydrogen, it's going to cause a two split. Now, if we look at this hydrogen here and the effects of the spins on these three here, we're going to get a range of things happening here. So if all the protons are aligned, it's going to increase the magnetic field. Uh, all of them against, it's going to decrease it. And then we can get all sorts of other combinations uh, so we can end up sort of having two up in different combinations or two down in different combinations. Uh, and if you add that up, it comes to this sort of peak here. So you've got sort of like a three layer here, three layer high here, and this is just one layer here. Uh, and so that's the different shape, and it's got four peaks. Uh, and so you can see again, uh, it's three neighboring plus one equals the number of peaks. Well, the number of peaks uh, is four and minus one. Uh, gives you three, gives you the number of na neighboring hydrogens. Uh, and here's another example here. And splitting occurs, doesn't occur with hydrogens in the same environment, which is this here. And so you're going to get uh, combinations here. You'll get a three peak one here, uh, and this one here, you'll get a two peak. And this here, here is just in written form just to tell you how the deshielding occurs. But this time we're looking at parts per million. And so if you have got shielding here, uh, it's going to decrease it. So there's a lower uh, chemical shift, so it's going to be higher up on the parts per million graph this time, not an energy graph of tetramethylsilane. And if it's uh, a lot stronger, it'll, it'll be a much stronger parts per million downward shift uh, from the standard, which is over here. So here we have it. HA only has two small peaks on high resolution. And this is low resolution here. This is low resolution here. And this one here is influenced by two more, two uh, neighboring, so that's got three peaks. So here are the rules, uh, just what I've said before. Number of splits on a peak are counted, and that tells you the number of uh, hydrogens, so just n plus one. What I haven't told you is how to work out the number of peaks. So to work out the number of peaks, you use Pascal's triangle. So put a one here, 
and then you, you add up the neighboring thing. So 0 plus 1 is 1, uh, 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 2, uh, 0 plus 1 is 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 2 is 3, uh, 3 plus 1 is 4, and so forth. And so by looking at these things here, you can work out uh, the number of peaks. If you know the, n the number of neighboring hydrogens, you know the number of peaks. And if you know the number of peaks, uh, you can also work out uh, the pattern of those peaks. Now what you won't have to do is an integration of the area under the graph, but the integration of the area under the graph also gives you the actual relative number of hydrogens. So here we have a problem. The feature of some proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectra is the electron absorbing withdrawing effect of electronegative atoms. These atoms cause nearby protons to produce peaks at higher chemical shift values, often in the range of 2.5 to 4.5 parts per million. Consider the spectrum of compound D, C4H8O2, uh, and you're just told that it does have a COO bond. The integration here tells us how many hydrogens there are for each of those peaks. By look, using Pascal's triangle here, we can also match up the patterns with the peaks to also confirm uh, the number of hydrogens. So the peaks peaks equal the number of hydrogens plus one, so the number of hydrogens equals basically the peaks minus one. Uh, looking down at the values then, 3.3, 2.3, and 1.1, uh, we can then go to the data booklet and look up the possible possibilities there. For the one, that's quite easy, it must be a CH3. The next one here, we've got two possible uh, compounds. We know there's a C double bond O. Lastly for this one, 3.3, uh, that only fits in there with an alcohol. Uh, so we can grab those three things and, and match them up together. So the only solution for that is methyl ethanoate C4H8O2. Uh, we can then do a double check. Yes, it does have a C double bond O. We can double check the number of neighboring hydrogens. That also checks out. Uh, and so all the pieces of the puzzle match and that seems to be the only solution that we can come to. X-ray crystallography, they've just, they haven't asked you to do the different diagrams, the Bragg's law, and, and how to draw it and how to do the calculations. I think they leave that to the physics guys. Uh, and so you just need to know that we use, this is using X-rays and the way that X-rays this time interact with the different bond lengths and angles and create a, a various pattern and then we use mathematics to determine large complex 3D structures uh, such as DNA and various uh, RNA and protein molecules.